All right, good morning. German punctuality right on time, so let's get started. Uh, Alex and I, we wanted to introduce you to one of our smaller projects. We call it Restic. And uh, yeah, well, catchy tagline, uh, at least catchy enough to, to drag you all in here. So this morning when we start to talk about uh, the, the project, um, Alex is uh, the, the lead developer, so he will then uh, drive you through uh, the, the test and, and the live demonstration. I will talk a little bit about the project background, so why did we feel that we need another backup solution? Uh, what uh, are the design principles along which we develop RESTIC? Um, some of the features and key components and what we do differently uh, compared to other solutions. And yeah, as mentioned, Alex will go through a quick demonstration and also explain the technical background on chunking and cryptography. And then uh, obviously we'll talk a little bit about the project and also how you can contribute and we count on your contribution as well. And also we'll leave a little room for uh, some questions and answers. So why did we feel that we need another backup solution? Um, Alex and I, we have some mutual infrastructure that we use and we have also thought about, okay, backup might be a good thing to do, uh, at least at one point in time. So we shared a backup server in a, a location that we felt is only partially secure. And um, this security is, okay, we wanted to do cryptography, but the server is hosted in a location, we won't tell you where, where someone else might uh, tamper with the system or might even get access to the system. So we felt that we would like to have a proper backup solution. So we tested a... Uh, a multitude of backup programs and also tried like using uh, EncFS over SSHFS and, and other things and yeah, obviously they didn't work so well and this is why we started the project and our use case was nothing special so we didn't want to back up like huge amounts of pictures or, or data it was really like a, a usual working directory here in this example it's 16 gigs of files 140k files and 36 um, uh, K directories, which is uh, some source, source code, images, audio files, some pictures. So really nothing special. And the solutions that we uh, tried out were mostly slow, slow and particularly over um, VAN connections and latency was um, a, an issue that we came across. And um, some of the programs, especially the older ones, they don't have um, cryptography, um, or uh, no deduplication, and uh, mostly um, not any of uh, the two. And um, the usability was also somewhat cumbersome with some of the um, programs that we tried. So we had um, configuration files, or they, they had to read chunks of the data and decrypt it before you can append a new backup. So these were the things that we came across, and um, that's why we started off with uh, discussing about the design principles and what we feel a good backup solution um, uh, should look. So um, it should be easy. So if it's not easy, you wouldn't do it, most likely. And I'm wondering who of you would say uh, wholeheartedly that you have a current backup of all of your data. And um, we also want it to be uh, scriptable, so you can run it when you log off, and it should be uh, pretty fast as well. So the only limitations should be like external factors, network, um, throughput through your hardware or such, and it shouldn't be limited um, with the software itself. It should be um, verifiable. So we wanted to check the integrity of the data at the backup uh, destination and uh, without decrypting it. So uh, Alex will explain, explain a little bit about um, how we've achieved that um, to avoid, for example, bit rotting, or bit rotting on the backup location. So you can, only, you can easily do a SHA-2 sum on the backup uh, destination and you can verify um, whether your integrity is there or if someone probably has tempered with uh, the, the data. Um, secure, so as mentioned initially, we thought the backup location might not be trustworthy. So that was one of the design principles. So we assume that the backup destination is never trustworthy. Another user might have root on the system or um, yeah, just physical access to, to the uh, software. Um, we also want to authenticate the backup on restore. So when you read the backup, it should be uh, verified if the backup was modified or not. Efficient. Um, so in, in some of the backup solutions, you would need to take a decision whether you take a full backup or an increment. And uh, this is something that we didn't want to do, or you do like regular full backups to not pile up in increments when you eventually restore it. So that's also something that we looked into. And uh, we do a deduplication not only on file base, but on uh, chunks of data. So uh, that's also that some of the solutions did lack. Yeah, and of course, it's free software. That's why we are here. 
and we use GitHub and have a pretty transparent development process, and we um, even internally use a, a small uh, development workflow, so we review what um, one of our fellow developers is doing before committing it to the repository. So a, a quick glance at the features. So we, we support Linux, um, OS X on, on Darwin, um, all the BSD variants and, and Windows. Just yet we do deduplication as just mentioned. The repository format, and that was also one of the design principles, is stable and extendable. So it's JSON, so we can extend it and without losing um, compatibility with prior versions. So that was also one of the design goals. It's already pretty fast. So our use case today that we will show you is a USB 3 um, hard drive that we have with us. And Alex will show you what the throughput is a, li a little later. Um, you can use one backup repository for multiple machine backups. And you can, when you have uh, different sources and you eventually um, use uh, this uh, for restoring to different machines at a later point in time, or the, uh, you have the same data on the machines, you can back up to the same repository and uh, deduplication is also working there. We have uh, pluggable backends and we felt that this is very important. So you can use uh, uh, local storage, SFTP is built in, we have a AWS S3 support and some more to come. Um, restoring backups can be a little cumbersome. So um, take a tar archive and you only want to restore one file. So it, it can be a pretty lengthy process when you just want to restore that one file. So we thought we want to have browsable backups. So we have a few support and Alex will also show um, how that works, how you can browse a, a backup and you can just copy that one file uh, out of the backup to um, your, your restore destination. And also a small embedded web server is about to be committed so you can um, browse then also your, your backups with um, this small web server. So some of the key components, I was explaining the functions. So it's the functions that all the backup solutions might have. So the archiver is taking care of uh, the, the backup, the restorer, obviously, of the, the restore, the fuse mount, and the checker. The checker has the integrity check component um, that can verify if the backup is persistent. They use the, the repository, and the repository makes use of the chunk. And Alex will also explain a little bit how we do chunking or um, in particular content-defined chunking here, and the repository will also uh, make use of uh, the uh, cryptography before it writes it to one of the pluggable backends. What's very important is the interface for the backends is relatively simple, so uh, new backends can be uh, integrated fairly um, easily. So um, I think that's already the point when you wanted to start off with a quick demonstration, Alex, so I think I need to hand over the microphone to you. So yeah, hi. Um, we just have one microphone, so we have to switch it, and we have to switch it back again, but uh, I don't think that this is a, a huge problem. Um, so the RESTIC implementation at the moment is, is written in Go. Um, that's a fairly new language uh, developed by Google. It's a static compiled language, and uh, it has a fairly good integrated testing support, for example. And uh, yeah, my original choice to write it in Go was uh, just to, temper, to, to play around with Go, and uh, so far it was a very good decision for that. Uh, for the cryptography, we use uh, AES and the Poly uh, 1305 uh, signature MAC algorithm. Uh, that's also quite fast. Um, many of the ideas uh, in uh, RESTIC come from uh, things like Git or Camly Store. Um, Camly Store is a Go implementation of a, or a data sharing and data backup system, and um, it also took a lot of ideas from from Git. One of the ideas was that uh, we address uh, things by uh, the, yeah we have content addressable storage like. The address for storing something like a chunk of data is um, yeah, something like the uh, SHA-2 sum uh, of the data itself. We will see that in a moment. For the metadata, something like directory structures, file names, and so on, we use JSON. Uh, that's, um, I think, not, a, not an obvious choice for a backup system, but we found that it was fast enough. And uh, JSON is really extendable, so if you have new fields that are um, present in a later version of the uh, repository, you can uh, also read it with an older version of RESTIC because the fields are just ignored, so it's extendable. Um, for the key derivation function, at the moment only uh, backups um, are secured by a password, but uh, you cannot really use a password as a direct input for the AES encryption function. You need a key derivation function, and for that we need S-Crypt to be as secure as possible. It's one of the better choices for a key derivation function. 
What we also do, we do uh, content-defined chunking. We will come to that in a bit. Um, that's uh, done by Rabin fingerprinting. And I wrote an implementation in Go for Rabin fingerprinting. And it's already really fast, although it's only written in Go. It's not, not, not like uh, it's uh, written in Assembler or uh, C yet. But uh, it's an optimization that's quite possible. Um, so for the content-defined chunking, for example, you have a file. Um, and you would like to, to backup it. And what RESTIC does, um, it computes a fingerprint, a Rabin fingerprint of 64-bit over a sliding window of 64 bytes. So for each window of 64 bytes, it computes the fingerprints. And um, in, at the uh, fingerprint below, you can see that it is always different for each uh, for each uh, 64 window of bytes. At some point in time, it will um, it will compute a fingerprint that has the uh, lowest uh, 20 bits set to zero. And this is one of the uh, this is the point where um, I yeah, define that the, the current chunk has ended and a new chunk is about to start. So, for example, in this case, the uh, upper file already has this first chunk. Uh, um, yeah, the first chunk was already found, and then it computes all the other chunks. And you can see that in the uh, in the picture, the orange the light orange box uh, in there is the uh, 64 byte before the end of the chunk that defines the chunk point. And um, in this case, we have four. Um, chunks for this for this file. Um, if you modify the file, for example, you change something in the first chunk, like there is an X and you make it a Y or something like that, then RESTIC will detect that the first chunk has changed, but the address uh, or the end of the first chunk hasn't changed. So all the other chunks are the same again. Um, the same is if you modify, for example, the second chunk and make it a shorter one, but don't change the 64 bytes before the end of the chunk, RESTIC will detect the same cut point and all the other chunks at the end of the file are the same again. So you can move chunks around and you can um, modify chunks and all the others will stay the same. So the deduplication really detects very well if you, if you move stuff in the file around, something like that. So the basic repository structure, like in, the, in this example, it's always the uh, local storage in a directory, but um, basically all the other uh, backends are modeled like this. You have a file called config. Um, everything on the slides that is... Um, Painted in a, with, a, with a slight red background is encrypted, and everything that's not with, with a white background is in plain text. So you have a config file that is encrypted, so um, and you have a, a number of key files. It's in the directory keys, and um, you can already see there that um, the file names are the uh, the first three bytes in this example, the first three bytes of the SHA-2 checksum of the contents. So. Um, in reality, it's longer, but on the slides, I've uh, shortened it to just the first uh, three bytes or six characters. So each repository has a number of key files. Uh, the key file looks like this. It has a JSON structure in, in plain text. There is some metadata on it, and it uh, has a salt and, and data. And um, usually, I enter my password into RESTIC, and then RESTIC tries to, to uh, load all the key files and tries to decrypt the data um, that is in the key file with the uh, key that is um, derived via S-script from the password. And uh, what's in the data basically is the, the master key for the repository. It's uh, designed something like Luke's, if you know uh, Linux file encryption. Um, there you already have, also have a, a master key for a volume, and we have a header with key slots and have a password for each key, each key slot. So once I've entered the correct password, um, RESTIC is able to decrypt the config file. And in this case, when I say decrypt, I always meant uh, decrypt and authenticate the uh, ciphertext before trying to actually decrypt something. So if, if an attacker is about to tamper with like the config file or exchange it for something, I can uh, detect it before I even try to decrypt it. So once I have the master password, then I can, for example, decrypt one of the snapshots. A snapshot is um, meant something like a structure, a file system structure at one point in time. So each time you take a backup, you get a new snapshot. We will see that uh, in, a, in a moment. In this case, the snapshot after decryption yields a JSON structure. And uh, in there, you have, for example, the path that has been backup. In this case, it's home FT0 web. That's my, my, uh, one of my work directories. You can see it was uh, made on the host name uh, Casimir, and it was my user, and so on, and, and the point in time at which it was taken. There are some other fields in it. And this basically references a tree. A tree is in a, a, a SHA-2 um, hash again, uh, 8.6, FB, and so on. And then from the repository, you can load this tree, identified by the SHA-2 sum of the contents of the JSON structure. And in there, you have a list of nodes. In this case, you can see that there is one directory. Uh, it's called web. And uh, one file, it's called file.tar.bzip2. 
and um, for the uh, for the web uh, directory, we have a uh, yeah another um, hint for a subtree six two six nine and so on. So if you were to restore this uh, web directory, you need to fetch this subtree uh, in the next step. If you want to restore this file, then you have like in this case uh, three different um, SHA two sums of chunks, and this is just the SHA two sum of the raw content chunk that has been there in this uh, in this order. So the file can be restored by just uh, fetching these three chunks from the repository, writing them to a file in this order, and then you uh, will have the file again. So um, one thing I haven't told you up to now is that I don't save, or, or RESTIC say it doesn't save any um, metadata or any chunk to a file directly, but it packs on, or bundles them together in, um, in, in several, uh, yeah, several chunks are bundled together in a pack file. And uh, this looks like this. Uh, all the things in the, in the, in the pack file, uh, there is a tree, there's data, 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 and at the end there's a header. And the header just uh, lists all the uh, things that are in the file. Um, the pack file itself isn't encrypted, but the chunks are encrypted uh, all by themselves. So uh, I can reorder them or restructure them without having to re-encrypt everything. In order to speed up the finding process, because otherwise, if I don't have like an index or something, then RESTIC needs to fetch all the headers of all the pack files to find where are the trees and where are the data chunks stored. Um, in this case, I have an index that's uh, just an optimization, and you don't really need it, but it's needed to, to be efficient and to be fast. And it lists like uh, in the data pack 7b and so on, there are these blobs, and these are of type tree or of type data. Uh, and if you have a look at the uh, tree again on the right side, you can see that uh, the subtree 62 isn't painted on this slide, but the content blobs 3f, 63, and dd, they are also in, uh, in this pack file. So if you need to fetch that, then I can restore it. So um, this was a lot of theory, and then I would like to do some, some demonstration for that. I'm going to sit down now. Um, so let me see. Okay, can you see that? Okay, great. Um, so the first thing, I, um, I've uh, attached this uh, USB storage uh, device here, and it's uh, on, oh, no, it sleeps, find mount. So it's just a USB device uh, connected over USB 3. Um, the first thing I need to do with uh, RESTIC is you need to initialize a repository. That's really easy to do. You have this RESTIC command. You've already installed it, for example. And uh, there you can do uh, minus R or repository, USB, and then you do init. And then you need to, to enter a password that's really similar to Luke's, like Luke's format. Um, then you have this repository. It has an ID that is saved in the content that's just for, used for uh, recognizing which repositories have been uh, already backed up. Um, yeah, then you can do a backup, for example, of my uh, directory data. Um, yeah, let me just uh, give you a few hints that uh, data is at the moment with, uh, yeah, made up something that uh, resembles a normal working directory. It's two gigabytes and there are files and videos and uh, MP3s and everything in it and a few kernel images and Debian ESOs. Um, if, we are, if you would like to backup this, you need to give uh, RESTIC the backup location, this B. Um, then backup, and then just the directory that should be backed up, and we need the password again. And uh, as you can see there, it's quite fast, like 70 megabytes per second, and this is a normal working speed if you have uh, like ASNI, these uh, extensions for in the CPU that uh, speed up uh, AES computation. And uh, yeah, it will take about like 10 seconds. So, okay, demonstration always takes longer. So in this case, it's, had, uh, it's done. Um, we can do another backup again, just to be sure. And there you can see that it already knows all the structures. It knows the files and the modification times, and it doesn't have to back up anything else. So uh, now I've done, yeah, like three backups. Um, and the command snapshot, oh, snapshots. It's there, I can list what, what backups did I made and what directories have been backed up and so on. Uh, in order to not have to type this repository location again, we can also export it uh, in an environment variable. And there you can just use this one. You can also export the password, but I will type it for, for demonstration purposes. Okay, so um, if I'm about to, um, to do something with my data, uh, in this case I have this, for example, uh, I have a, a large Debian ISO, um, 
And let's, let's say I have another uh, version of this ISO in a, in a file called foo. Um, there you can see that it takes up twice the space because it's not a deduplication file system. But if I'm about to, to back up uh, this uh, directory again, so we don't need that anymore. Oh. You can see it is, it is still quite fast. Uh, this uh, 800 megabyte per second or something like that is not really, but it's using uh, the already known uh, chunks when the uh, new ISO file is read um, to recognize that these chunks have already been saved. So they are not transmitted and not saved in the repository again. Um, we can, for example, check that, uh, what's the size? It's, uh, oh no. Yeah, there are 2.1 gigabyte. And uh, this is just the size of the uh, data directory, or it's just even, that's uh, even a bit larger because of the second ISO file that I put there. Okay, so um, if I'm about to restore something, um, just uh, we all hope that this uh, point in time never comes, but sometimes you have to restore things from the backup. Then you can, uh, for example, have a look at which uh, snapshots are there. And there you can see that, uh, for example, this, uh, this last uh, backup, I would like to have a look at it. Yeah, we can use LS with a... Um, so there you can see that these are all the files that are in there. Okay, it's not wide enough, so I will just use this. Yeah, you can see the directory structure. And uh, for example, there's this, this last file. It's a markdown file of uh, my, uh, my notes here. And um, if I would like to restore that, we can uh, use uh, RESTIC um, restore to temp restore. And uh, I can use either uh, this complete backup or I can, uh, for example, like include star.md so only MD files are restored. Okay, and when I have a look at temp restore, there you can see there's data for track and there are my notes. Okay, and uh, this is quite cumbersome, I think, because even I, as a developer for RESTIC, uh, need to remember all the uh, command line switches and so on. So uh, we uh, also added the uh, possibility to mount uh, this repository via Fuse. And uh, I will mount it in my uh, home directory in a, file, uh, in a directory called MNT. And now I'm creating a new tab um, um, and we'll have just a look at uh, the MNT thing. There's a snapshots and there are directories for, for all of the snapshots and I've been using the last one. There you can see there's this data, Vortrag, Vortrag.md and I can cat it and it will work. And uh, for demonstration purposes, <laughs> we also included um, a large video for, from the Blender project in the videos directory. It's, it's quite large. It's, uh, and we can even uh, play that one. Oh, where it is? No. Nope. Ah, it's gone. I have no idea where the, where the uh, window went. Ah, there it is. Yeah, you can see that it's, it's a full HD thing and it uh, plays really, really fast over the fuse, uh, over the fuse mount from the USB dri uh, 3 device. And you can uh, also like uh, browse pictures, MNT pictures, and they have taken some. Uh, oh, did it? No. Ah. And I can even browse the older versions of, of files there. Uh, like these are my uh, holiday pictures, and uh, you can uh, view the pictures and so on. And if I'm about to look at uh, what has changed, um, remember I've, I've added the foo file, which was a copy of the Debian ISO file in uh, one of the later snapshots. We can, for example, look at the first one and have like data Debian ISO, and there is just one Debian ISO file. And if I'm looking at the later one, there yeah, I can see that there is also the foo file, and I can mount that, or copy that away, or have a look at it and browse the files. I use diff, for example, that's also possible. Okay. Afterwards, don't forget to un unmount it. Okay, this was a, a quick demonstration. Um, the current status is that uh, we have released the, uh, the, the first version. The repository format is quite stable. And um, we would like to have uh, users using it now. So uh, we are trying to make really sure we're using semantic versioning. And we're making sure that the repository format is always compatible. So you, when you do some backups now, you're able to restore them and access them in a year or something like that. 
Uh, we need to uh, implement more backends like uh, Google uh, Cloud Storage Nearline, Amazon Glacier, and so on. Uh, we'd like to use to do user interface improvements. For example, the restore workflow is too complicated at the moment. Um, maybe add a dialogue-based system for that. We would like to add compression. We would like to resume interrupted backups and, yeah, of, of course, more performance. Um, maybe support the workflow to do asymmetric uh, crypto on, on the backups so you can, uh, you can have a server with... Uh, um, important data on it and uh, do some backups for this server and when, when a server is hacked the attackers doesn't have access to um, all the old uh, backups they are unable to decrypt them because the private key used to decrypt data is not on the server um, and other workflows like uh, reading a backup from standard in think mysql dump for example uh, getting started is really easy you can clone the repository um, CD into the repository and just type go ran build.go. Um, it will take care of all the usual stuff you have to figure out while, while using or compiling a Go program. And then you can use init and backup and that's it. At the moment, it's, uh, yeah, it's free software. It will stay free software, of course. It's a two clause BSD license. So you can find the repository there. Um, we're using a, a, some, some kind of like an agile workflow as far as you can talk about agile when uh, developing an open source project with a redistributed really developer base. Um, at the moment, we have three uh, contributors for uh, that uh, do core development and uh, 12 other contributors, and some are even present here. Uh, thanks a lot for your contribution. Um, you can help by use RESTIC, report bugs. Um, we are sure that there are bugs uh, hidden in there, we have, uh, and we are really, sure, really grateful for all the reports that point bugs out to us because then we can fix them. And, uh, of, of course, also request features that we might, may haven't seen up to now. Okay, do you have any questions? Yeah, please. Um, is it possible um, to give names as natural? Um, like names like... Uh, yes, uh, this is uh, the match for I... Mm -hmm. at, the moment, at the moment, it's not possible, but there is an issue about adding like tags to... Uh, to snapshots, and that's really easy to uh, implement because you can, we can all just uh, add a tax field to the JSON structure, and uh, you can do something like that. And we take this as a plus one for that issue. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No. You have that list of snapshots, and the only thing you have is the date. Yes, and uh, the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can we can add that. Um, the the tax issue is is something like adding a string to a backup while making the backup, and um, we can we can implement that. If you if you're interested in that, um, we, we take that as a plus one uh, to implement this feature. And uh, it might be it might become uh, a little bit uh, hard to find a specific backup when you have a lot of backups in there. So uh, it's it's a good idea. If there was a way of organizing uh, an actually understanding better, like with uh, using uh, some private public key instead of having someone type the password. Mm -hmm. um, the question was uh, if it is possible to do automated backups uh, nightly, something like that. Um, at the moment, we only have the possibility to uh, access the repo with a password. So you can uh, export the password in an environment variable and have RESTIC use that. These asymmetric workflow that you're talking about, like using a public key to encrypt data, that cannot be decrypted again with this public key, but require the private key for decryption. And I think that's what you're talking about. It's not implemented at the moment, but it's planned. Okay. Yeah, please. Um, when you want to back up to a remote location, um, is it, uh, do I have to install RESTIC on the system where the uh, important data lies, or do I have to install it on the system where the backup location is? Um, the, the question was uh, what, what software requirements are uh, needed for a, for a remote location. Um, at the moment, we have uh, several backends that don't require any, an installing anything else. Um, so, for example, we have uh, SFTP impl uh, implemented, and it really only uses the F SFTP protocol. So you just have to uh, be able to use the SFTP client to connect to a server and have them something like OpenSSH running and uh, providing an SFTP server. That's enough. 
Um, it's not the most efficient way to do it because SFTP was designed uh, in a time where uh, people thought it was a good idea to hard code like buffer sizes and so on. So we have to, uh, in order to transfer large amounts of data, we have to uh, transfer really small buffers. So um, it's not the most efficient uh, backup uh, backend, but um, it's possible and doesn't need any installing anything else. With a question For, over here. Yeah. Uh, to what? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, uh, your question was, um, is it possible to do uh, hot, so backup. So hot backup of... Okay, at the moment it's it's not possible. Um, you have to um, build something around it, like for example an LVM snapshot of a, a currently in used file system. So you have a, a specific snapshot of your file system at some point in time. Um, for Windows, there is this uh, uh, shadow copy service who provides nearly the same. Um, it's not implemented in RESTIC at the moment, but it's certainly possible to either do that uh, at the uh, around the backup program uh, and, uh, around the backup process. For example, for VM images. Um, or even included in RESTIC, but it's not included at the moment. Um, what, what is an encrypted directory in, in, in your case? So you have... Um, yeah, RESTIC, at the moment, RESTIC just uses the normal kernel interface to like list the directory and open the files. And, uh, you need the key for the So when you, um, for example, you want to uh, back up all home directories, then mm -hmm. they are encrypted and only the user has a key, of course. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing with that? Yeah, you, you, either, you can either back up the encrypted directory from the outside so that the encrypted directory is, uh, is saved in the backup. And when you, have, when you restore, then you can uh, yeah, you also restore the encrypted directory and need the user to enter his password, for example, to decrypt it again. Um, or you can have a user like unlocking his home directory and encrypt uh, or backupping uh, the uh, plain text files. Um, there is no integrated like decrypting something like an encrypted home directory at the moment. Yeah, that's one one possibility. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, the repository um, or the complete project just uses a Go compiler um, as a dependency. We use some some external Go libraries, but they are all um, included in the repository as a, in, a, in the vendor directory. So we can have like a deterministic building for something. If you, if I have, I'm using uh, this version of the Go compiler under Linux, and somebody else uses the same Go compiler under Linux, the same binary, then it will result in the same RESTIC binary. And um, having the dependencies vendored in the uh, GitHub repo also means that I'm able to like use Git bisect on all my dependencies. That's really nice. Right. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, any like um, building um, distro packages or, or getting mm -hmm. into official. Yeah, this um, we, we are at the moment we are trying to build distro packages. Uh, it's a slow process because you have to do it for all the different distros. At the moment, there are packages like for for Arch Linux and uh, Homebrew on Mac. And uh, we will probably add, add others. It's just that we have released uh, the first release uh, in just like a few days ago, um, and we need to do some, some more tests, some more backups, and over time we will insert it into the distributions. And my last question, how do you handle settings or things in Python? All, all the special files are already handled, at least under Linux and uh, BSD and Darwin. So symlinks are backup as what they are, symlinks. And uh, we can even uh, backup like... Um, um, uh, device files, uh, character devices, and so on. And uh, for hard links, uh, it's, the implementation isn't isn't finished at the moment. Thomas had a question. Yeah. Um, do you have implemented a way uh, to remove old backups? <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Uh, the question was if, if we uh, have implemented a way to remove old backups. I've heard that other backup systems lack this possibility at the moment. Um, 
At the moment, it's not finished, but it's, we already started the process. We can, uh, in the, I've, I've shown you that there is, for each snapshot, there is a file in the repository. You can remove that and run the check process, which will detect that there are dangling uh, blobs that aren't used anymore, and in the future it will be able to remove them and repack the others uh, that are maybe used in the same pack file. So there is a pull request outstanding, and I'm working on it at the moment. Okay, yeah. Next one. Are you taking care of the extended attributes and security labels mm -hmm. under Linux? The question was, um, if we already take uh, care of uh, extended attributes and security attributes uh, at, in Linux, for example, um, at the moment the answer unfortunately is no, because we've just started, but it's an, uh, it's an issue in the, in the GitHub, and uh, yeah, we're planning to implement that. Unfortunately, at least from my point of view, the ACL handling isn't standardized across different operating systems, so we have to do an implementation for like each operating system. So it will take some time, but it is planned to also back up this. Next question. Yeah. Um, you said that the uh, um, index files mm -hmm. are stored unencrypted. No, they are also stored encrypted in the. Uh, Everything is encrypted except these things that you need to derive the master key password. Like everything except the key files um, is uh, stored encrypted. But the key files don't have any information about uh, structure of files. No, they don't know anything. In the key files, you can you can think of something like a, a Luke's key slot. Uh, it basically just holds a, a timestamp and a salt and the encrypted data for the master key. That's it. Everything else is encrypted. And do you have a structure in your repositories, or do you store all the JSON files there in one? Oh, no. Um, the question was if you have a, a structure with subdirectories, and yes, we have a structure with subdirectories uh, to account for like having a repository with many files. So there is one subdirectory level uh, for the data files. Wow. Yeah, at the moment. So you have large files and a lot of small chunks. Uh, you have a lot of JSON set in one. Uh, no, be, because when we have, um, the question was, um, if we, uh, store these, all the different JSON files in a, in a, in a, in a lot of small files, and no, we're bundling them together up to like 20k, uh, JSON structure files if they are really small in one file. So we are just, we are bundling uh, the files together so we don't have so many, so many small files. Yeah. Uh, can I add a backup? Because I'm thinking about, we have some very crazy laws in Germany, like destroying duty, mm -hmm. and so you might want, might have the need to get a single data mark of your backup. Mm -hmm. So is it possible to edit your backup, edit files from the backup, or edit uh, everything with full files? Mm -hmm. like this? Yeah, the question was, uh, if if we need to implement like German data laws that require distracting data or removing even removing data from a backup, um, at the moment, this is not implemented, but we have an issue about that, exactly about the, uh, the thing like, oh, uh, by accident I uh, committed the uh, password file with the secret data in it to the backup, and I need to remove that from every revision. And um, it's possible, but we have to rewrite the data. Um, there is um, the, one of the, uh, the basic attributes of the repository structure is that things stored there are just written once. So if we have to, uh, like, change something, you read it, and you write a new version again, and then remove the old version, and need to correct all the references in the JSON files. Uh, it's not impossible, but at the moment not implemented. Okay. If everything is encrypted, even the JSON files, how are you going to implement the asymmetric encryption? Um, good question. We don't have a plan for that right now that is completely ready. We have um, also have, already have a discussion in the, in the issue describing this asymmetric uh, use case, because we need to, to understand what is the exact use case for it. Um, it's not so easy because there might be many different use cases. For example, this, I'm, I'm using RESTIC to back up a server and afterwards restore it. And if the server is hacked, the backup system uh, or the, the data in the backup, the old data especially, should not be accessible. That's just one use case. Um, one of the ideas was that maybe um, different keys are used to encrypt like data and metadata. And uh, for example, that uh, when, a, when a system uh, is doing backups with RESTIC and it just has the private key for decrypting the metadata again in order to do efficiently backups, but um, it doesn't have the private key for the data on it. That, but this really depends on your use case. So maybe you would also like to uh, have the metadata encrypted only in one way and you have like a local cache, for example. We need to discuss that and afterwards uh, plan what we're doing, what we're going to implement. 
Uh, I think you said you can verify the data integrity on the server mm -hmm. without having the decryption key. How do you do it? Um, good question. The question was, um, we advertised that it was possible to um, verify that there was no, no bit rot or uh, the, the backup data on the server hasn't changed. And uh, what RESTIC basically does is everything that is saved on the server in a remote location is uh, the file name is always the SHA-2 sum of the contents, of the encrypted contents. So on the server, you can just run like SHA-256 sum uh, on the files with a script or something like that. It will read the files, output the uh, SHA-2 uh, hash of it, and you can, can compare it to the uh, to the file name, even without decrypting anything. That doesn't protect against attackers that are able to write the uh, repository because they can uh, like modify some file there and move it to a new file name that uh, the uh, hash uh, corresponds again. Um, but you can check, for example, if the hard disk is faulty or the RAM is faulty, and uh, during write, if something went wrong or so. Okay. Um, I, I don't understand the question. Can you? Um, I think the question was that uh, if it is possible to um, use public or private cloud implementations to store the backups. And uh, at the moment, it's, for example, uh, possible to use S3 by Amazon uh, to store data. The backend is implemented. But um, other backends are not implemented at the moment, for example, for, for own cloud or uh, like Google Drive or something like that. But uh, we tried to make the interface uh, for implementing a backup really small and really easy to implement, so it should be easy to add that. And for example, for, for the uh, Google Cloud or for uh, Amazon Glacier, there are already uh, Go libraries that do the interface for you. You just have to adapt it to be used as a backend in RESTIC. The question was, what, what happens if I back up a sim link on Linux and restore it on an NTFS file system on Windows? And uh, the general policy for, for these kinds of things is that RESTIC will output a warning that is not possible to like extract a sim link. Um, in the case of a sim link, it, it might be possible to just add a, a symbolic link or something like that in, in, in the NTFS file system. But the general policy is to output an error about it that it's not possible to restore this, this type of file on this file system and continue to restore other things. Yeah, that's, that's no problem at all. The question was uh, um, if it is possible to um, back up a system in a little Anion system, like where the byte order is uh, starting with a with lowermost byte, and restore it on a big Anion system, and that's no problem at all, because um, on the data side, we're just moving moving bytes from the files to the backup repository and back again. And for, all, for everything else that it's uh, metadata, that's either JSON, like uh, ASCII encoded uh, numbers, and that doesn't depend on the byte order, and uh, there's one exception for the pack files. Uh, we have a little, yeah, small format for uh, for the for bundling the pack files together. And one of the fields there is the length of the chunk, and this is defined as to be little endian. So that's it's no problem at all. Can I change the encryption key? Uh, the question was if you can change the encryption key. Um, uh, question back to you: What encryption key do you mean? The master key or the password? <laughs> I thought the master key derived uh, from uh, the normal uh, passphrase uh, by, uh, by uh, the, uh, the, the S script function, yeah. Um, uh, the, idea, the idea behind my question was uh, if I have a backup running for half a year or so, uh, I might think it's a good idea to change the password. What mm -hmm. if uh, so. So, so the question was, what happens if somebody gets my password, or if it, is, it, is it possible to, to change my password for the backup uh, remote backend um, at some point in time, like every half year or so? Um, the, the answer is that the master key is always uh, yeah, for a repository, and you cannot easily change that. But we have this one level of indirection by using the password that the user supplies 
to derive a key to decrypt the master, part, master key. So the design is really similar to, to Luke's again, where you have a, a password and you can use uh, that to decrypt the master key and with the master key decrypt the, de the device. And uh, it's possible to have multiple passwords and it's possible to change the password, but if an attacker has access to the backup location, um, the attacker is able to just make a backup of the old key file. It's the same for, for Luke's. If, we, if I have an attacker who has copied my, my complete device, including the Luke's header, and uh, afterwards learns my password, he can use that with the, with the Luke's header that he has already saved. So changing the password in this case um, doesn't give you anything, but you can do it, and it's implemented. Next question. I think you said somewhere that you use AES counter mode. How do you handle the counter? Um, the question was how do we initialize the uh, counters for AES encryption? Because uh, AES counter mode encryption, uh, when you use that, you have to make sure that you use really random counters. And in this case, it's uh, generated, uh, a random counter value is generated. So we have like, we generate an IV, it's uh, 16 bytes of, of random with a cryptographically, cryptographically secure pseudo random number generator. And um, we use that and flip the bits and increment them for counter mode. It's a standard practice for that. So we have this really, really, really small chance that uh, two um, initialization vectors will be completely different for 16 bytes of random, but it's really unlikely. Okay. What would be uh, your recommended approach to convert an existing backup to a RESTI format? Like, for example, I'm having on target, I'm already having in the file system, I don't want to, to um, yeah, copy everything again with RESTI. Okay. But just, but just say, well, this is what I have, take this for the first run, and then proceed from there. The question was, what are the migration strategies from uh, if I have a remote location where I've already backed up my, all my data to, uh, do I need to back up this again in order to use RESTIC? And uh, my recommendation was uh, would be to, if the remote location is somewhat trustworthy, so you trust it to store your data for a short amount of time, you can um, extract your data there, um, it depends on the format, what you have there. You could extract your data there, run RESTIC once with all the data there, remove it again, and then use RESTIC from the, uh, from your original location. Because then you have an, a repository that is initialized with all your data already, all the chunks are there, all the uh, directory structures are there, and RESTIC will just, just use that for the duplication. So you're always, you're not only transmitting, uh, the, uh, yeah, the data that is new and hasn't been stored on the backup location. So it recognizes Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially the data. So if a data chunk is in the repository, it will always use that one in the repository and not store it again. The question was if it is possible to, to exclude uh, files or directories, and yes, that's, that's possible. We have a simple exclude uh, command line switch for the backup uh, already. And there are plans to like um, implement a, a more sophisticated one where you can have a file with, with patterns or directories that aren't to be backed up or something like that. It's, uh, yeah, it's possible and it will be possible in the future to do more things. And can you do the same thing based on the size? So do not back up files bigger than something also? Oh, interesting use case. The question was if it's possible to exclude, to exclude files based on the size, like uh, do not back up small files or do not back up especially large files. Um, I haven't thought about that up to now, but maybe if, if it's interesting, we will implement it. Um, it should be really easy to do. Sometimes it's interesting for bootstrapping a new backup. You first want to back up all the small files because mm -hmm. sometimes they're really important but your latest Debian ISO is maybe not that important. Mm -hmm. So you just back up first all the small things and later you go to the bigger ones. Yeah, so for example, when you initialize a backup, I'm, I'm repeating the question for the, for the audience later. Um, when you want to do an initial backup of your, like, your working directory, you would like to exclude all the large Debian ISO files uh, because they don't need to, to be backed up. And it's not possible, but we will we, we consider adding it. And we appreciate your issue about yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any questions? Yeah, please. Um, you said you back up on your own hard drive and you want to localize that to another location from the hard drive. Mm -hmm. the backup <laughs> okay, also so good question. Yeah. It, um, should be quite easy because uh, Eric only compares change data and you only saw change data from the backup and edit. Yeah, you don't have to compare the data that, mm -hmm. that edit. 
Um, so the question was, how do how can can I make a really fast backup on a local hard drive, but replicate this repository to another location? And um, as you already suggested, you can just use rsync to just transfer the files and transfer the updated files. Um, and uh, it's even possible to just use the new files because Restic always uh, will add files and do not change them. So once they are in the repository, they are not changed, but there are new files created and maybe files removed if we remove a snapshot, for example. So uh, just moving the files to remote location, uh, that is sufficient. You can just restore them from the remote location. That's possible. Okay, any other questions? Um, the question was if RESTIC handles sparse files. At the moment, RESTIC doesn't handle sparse files specifically. Uh, sparse files are files that have like holes in them. When you read them, you will get a, a whole bunch, a bunch of zeros. Um, but the deed application already uh, is able to handle this, uh, this case fairly well because uh, when I read uh, large amounts of zeros, then I will recognize that this is a block of zeros. Oh, I already have that one and don't save it to the backup again. Um, but uh, we can, uh, yeah, we maybe will add uh, sparse file support by recognizing these special holes in the files and handle them speci specially because we don't have to like read all the zeros if we know there are only zeros. We can just uh, add that to the metadata information. There's no support for restoring currently? No, there's, at the moment there's no support for restoring. When you restore um, a sparse file, you will end up with a, with a non-sparse file with uh, filled with zeros. That's a limitation at the moment. We will, we will add that later on. Did you also have a question? Ah, oh, okay. It was already answered. Yeah, yeah. One question about the repository. But from my point of view, really slow when you have read many files mm -hmm. in one directory. Like they're okay with 1,000, or I'm from 10,000 on it gets too slow. Um, the, the question was, um, when, when there are really a lot of files in the repository, won't it get slow if uh, on, on s at least some file system, in, if there are something like 10,000 files in a directory? And uh, for that, we have in the, in the data directory, we already have one level of subdirectories and uh, store the files there. So the, the first byte is uh, actually used for uh, creating a subdirectory. And we will probably add more if this becomes a problem uh, in the future. But at the moment, it's just one level. And um, um, we can... Uh, the repository is also, ah yeah, there you can see it. Um, the repository is also uh, structured in a way that, uh, like snapshots and, for example, data files are in different directories because the snapshots, uh, I'm, I'm, um, RESTIC must be able to, like, efficiently list them and read them in order to display them to the user or find the latest snapshot the current backup is based on. Um, so we move that to a different directory and the data files in, a, yeah, in another directory. Just a short comment, uh, you showed that you only use one byte for this directory. Uh, you could just easily use two bytes and have a single level, but just have 64K yeah. directories instead of 256. Yeah, we could have also used like two bytes, but at the moment it's, it's one byte, and when it becomes a problem, we will deal with it or make it configurable or something like that. Yeah. Do you need a special I just came, the idea came because X2 has a subdirectory with a bunch of two subdirectories. Do you need a special file system uh, to backup? Or the question was if we need a special file system for, for it to not, not, not yeah? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so if we need a special file system for the repository that holds the backup data. And I don't think that we have any limitation like this, but the, uh, the limit you mentioned, like 32K files for, for X2, uh, it might become a problem if you back up to X2. Um, but yeah, please, please give, it, give it a try. If you run into this limitation, write an issue and we will deal with it. Okay, yeah. What happens if the file system that is to be backed up changes after the snapshot has been made? Um, like the um, when the when the directory changes that you are you backed up or uh... Uh, the, 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 the directory that you want to back up you, you said that you make a snapshot of it before and what happens if the file the, the directory has changed after you made the snapshot? Um, so you said it's not the topic, it's that you have yeah. to use that or something like that. To the, make the, the question was uh, what happens if a file is changed while the snapshot is running or while uh, the, 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 yeah, while the snapshot hasn't finished, for example, when you back up a, a large directory, some files might change in between. For example, and move the directory mm -hmm. from a part where you have done the snapshot mm -hmm. to a location where 
Okay, the example was a file was moved. Uh, um, yeah, a file has been backed already, but the backup process wasn't finished, and you move it while the backup is running to a different directory that is again backed up, backed up later. Um, in this case, Restic will uh, include the newly moved file in the backup a second time, uh, but it won't save any new data because of the deduplication, because all the data in the file has already been saved to the repository. It will just include like a reference to this data in the uh, metadata again. Okay, any other questions? Okay then, thanks a lot for, for listening. Uh, give it a try and report all bugs that you may find. Thank you.